I am pleased to introduce our expert presenter, Lav Metcalf. Lav is a licensed wellness coach, educator, and an organizational health consultant specializing in marketing and program development of wellness information to consumers. She served on the faculty at the University of Arizona College of Medicine for over 18 years and has over 30 years of experience as a practitioner for work site and community projects involving weight management, health promotion, childhood obesity, and the effects of exercise on bone mass. She is the author of Reshaping Your Body, Rethinking Your Mind, a book in correspondence course addressing weight loss and body image concerns of women. She is also a co-author of the Best Exercise Program for Osteoporosis Prevention. Today, Lav is presenting Strength Training for Postmenopausal Women. Please welcome Lav Metcalf. Hi, thanks Tish, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm real excited about this information because I've been involved with it for over 15 years now, and I've got a power-packed uh, hour to share with you uh, the history of what um, I feel is just some really important information for encouraging more women, and particularly postmenopausal women, to get involved with exercise and specifically strength training. So uh, this all started with a National Institute of Health grant that our team at the University of Arizona wrote back in the mid-1990s. And at first we were declined uh, our grant because they didn't feel that uh, postmenopausal women would actually do strength training and do it to the extent that we had suggested in our in our research. But we forged ahead, you never, you never die, you never say never, and you re reapply your grants, and we were able to uh, get the grant on the second go around. And uh, it was the largest funded grant on osteoporosis and bone health uh, for women that NIH has ever given out. And I believe that's still true today. So we were excited about what our team was to put together. And uh, from that, from that, uh, that study, we were able to monitor and follow these women through an actual just strength training program for the last 10 years. So we've got some great data that I'm going to share with you today. And the whole process of what we did and the exercises that we used from strength training, uh, I'm going to be able to offer that up to you as well. And then the other piece of it that I think is real important is how do we keep individuals and particularly women in this kind of an age range and, and sedentary to begin with, how do we keep them excited and interested in strength training? So I've got some a variety of different mechanisms that we used to get that uh, up and rolling. So hopefully the smattering of information will be good. You might be uh, wanting a little bit more information at some periods of time, so just write that down. You can email me. I'd be more than happy to give you a little bit more um, uh, in-depth uh, explanation if uh, be, but because of the time we have here, and I really did want to give you a presentation that was similar to what I would do if I was going to go out into the communities. For the last couple years, I have had some foundation uh, grants to be able to help deliver this information to different communities across the United States. So that's where you see the, the bone health, creating a best practice community on the slide. So my intention for you is to understand the opportunities that you could have to be able to utilize this information, not only just for your own clients, but how can we be able to develop communities of health that focus in on some of these essential aspects of, of women's health uh, that's so desperately needed. So that's, um, that's kind of my overview. And uh, so let's kind of begin with this. Um, I was a part of the uh, College of Medicine team that put this together. I was one of the co-investigators in it, but I also ran the intervention, the exercise program. So I have known these women and been involved with them, as I said, for over 15 years. The women that you're seeing in the slide right now are basically in their 70s right now. So they are, they all have at least completed uh, 10 years of exercise with us, with the foundation being the, the best program. But the caveat for this, too, is as far as these exercises are good for women that are in their 30s and 40s and uh, might just have healthy bone. This is, a, this is some a focus for strength training, not only to build bone or to maintain bone, but it's also good for maintaining uh, muscle strength. And you'll see that as we go through the exercises. So basically, as far as if you have clients that are over 50, some of them may or may not be concerned about their bones. And unfortunately, they need to be concerned about their bones. And we need to be concerned about our bones after 30. If you see the, the bone, the normal bone that's on the left, that's 
normal. <laughs> but osteoporotic bone is kind of porous bone. It looks more like honeycomb. It's, it fractures easy, easily. It's, uh, it's a challenge as far as um, being able to maintain it. And the reason we call it the silent disease is you don't know you have it until usually you have a, some sort of a fall or fracture. As far as the osteoporosis pre uh, prevalence in the, in the country, 44 million are affected by osteoporosis or low bone mass. 80% of those are women, but also men after about 70, 75 years of age, they become affected as well. So uh, there's at least 50% of the women that you're dealing with are going to have some sort of an osteoporosis related fracture in their lifetime once they're over 50. So this is alarming and it's something that we can prevent to, to a certain extent. So in this slide, what I'd like for you to focus on is as far as the women with low bone mass, there are 21.8 million of them out there. And these numbers are going to double uh, and uh, it might be earlier than, than 2050, but we do have a, a large concern about low bone. The way that our younger kids are eating these days, the lack of activity, we're just going to see this be a more pronounced uh, issue and epidemic as we go into the future. So being able to address this as a part of a full uh, uh, wellness program and exercise program is, is really crucial. If you look at where the fracture sites are, typically are, uh, and this is one of the reasons that we chose the exercises that we did for, for the bone health, is that you have the thoracic vertebra that's a, that's a major fracture site, the lumbar vertebra, the distal radius in the wrist, and uh, the hip area. So the, uh, the, the intention and the focus on the exercises had to do with these major fracture sites for us. And a lot of common consequences of fractures are diminished quality of life, the shortening of stature, kyphocus, and decreased mobility, hospitalization, just lacking the vitality and the, um, the ability to be able to go about and do common things. Uh, and I know a lot of the women that got involved with our program, they did not want to lose that independence. And they were still vibrant women, but they have been sedentary. And for those of you that know clients that come in that just don't have that spark and that energy, um, this is a way to help them and to kind of influence them that taking care of their health and their bone health is a, is a good part of what you're going to offer them with your programming. The financial costs are in, important too. This is something that the National Osteoporosis Foundation has been spearheading in Washington and throughout the states. And hopefully you're in a state that has some sort of an osteoporosis co coalition. Uh, I, would, since, uh, I would encourage you to contact your state and to see as far as how, um, how much advocacy you do have, because I know that in the state of Arizona, we've worked with, uh, our team at the university has worked with uh, uh, Arizona State University and, and uh, NAU to be able to really have some good research and education so that our, our decision makers uh, from a, a law standpoint as well as an education standpoint can be able to provide good resources throughout our state. So check that uh, as you get off the webinar today as well. So, okay, how, how do we define osteoporosis? If your client came up and said, you know, I'm not real sure if I have it or not, what do, what do I do? Well, osteoporosis is uh, defined as two, two and a half standard deviations below a healthy um, um, adult's uh, T-score. So if you look at the colors, and hopefully you can see the colors that are in the slide, normal bone is the yellow part that's up on the top. And then your low bone or osteopenia would be the orange bone or the orange sec sec section of this. And then the red is osteoporosis. That's two and a half standard deviations below. Basically, most women build bone up until the age of 30. And then after 30, there's a slow decline in bone until menopause. And then there's a more rapid decline of about 2 to 5% uh, to during the menopausal years. And that was why we wanted to kind of focus our research on that decline to see if we could be able to slow it down, to retard it, or even hopefully to be able to build it during that slippery slope that we saw. Well, the interesting thing here is if you see the gentle waves, depending on how how um, uh, healthy your bone is to start with gives you whatever your slope you're going to be in, involved in. So, so this is why it's crucial for, for young women to build bone as much as they can up to 30 and then even to maintain that after 30 because you'll see if a healthy bone, the higher sweep of that green line is going to allow that person at the end of their life at 85 or 90 just to be in a little bit of osteopenia. 
But if you're starting out with low bone at the very beginning, where you might be in osteopenia, you're going to osteoporosis by 45. So it's, um, it's, a, it's an important aspect to, to consider. Um, the way that you measure bone or the way that, that our team measures bone, and a lot of times as far as if you're going to get a, a bone screening or a DEXA screening out in your community with your primary care physician, DEXA is the state of the art right now for uh, doing a, uh, a bone scan. I know that they're creating a lot of different varieties that you could be able to use in community fitness facilities and at other satellite spots, but um, uh, our team uses the DEXA right now, and one of the reasons that we do like DEXA is that not only does it show us our, our bone um, health, but it also shows, shows us our lean body tissue and from a sarcopenia standpoint, being able to get some information on that. But what will happen as far as if, you've, uh, if, if those of you on the call have ever had a bone scan, is you'll get basically three different renditions in that. You'll get a total body scan, you'll get a, a spine scan, and you'll get a hip scan. Uh, scan. And then this is going to be able to give you some indication of, uh, of how healthy your bone is. And I know that um, uh, there's a lot of times as far as the the health maintenance organization that I'm with, uh, they do not encourage a, a bone scan until you're in your mid-50s. Um, our team encourages everyone to at least get some sort of a baseline scan you know, in your 40s, and particularly if you have any kind of risk factors, and we're going to go over those real soon. But it's important to know where you are so that you can be able to get started in a program such as this program I'm going to offer you as soon as possible. So the risk factors. Uh, if you have a client and they haven't gotten a bone scan, how can you as a professional be able to kind of get a good sense of where they are as far as their bone health? Well, being, being female, this gives us a great opportunity to get more osteoporosis than men, and it's just one of the benefits, I guess. But also as far as having a, a small skeleton uh, is, is uh, uh, an indicator, and being either Caucasian or of Asian descent is, uh, is, is an, uh, a risk factor. If you are, you can ask your clients as far as do they have a family history of osteoporosis? Have they had any fractures? They might not know the osteoporosis question, but they can be able to tell you, oh, you know, my mother had a fracture here. She had, you know, a kyphosis when she got into her, her 60s. You know, those things are, are indicators of, uh, of some low bone. Medications also can negatively affect bone health. And then as we age, we get even more susceptible. But the good news, as most of you I'm sure are, is we're all about prevention. There are some risk factors that you can change. One, certainly uh, cigarette smoking. We know that cigarettes uh, you know, have a, a negative effect on so much uh, of our quality of life, but it does not um, also uh, focus on, on bone. Low body weight uh, is an indicator that we can change. And high consumptions of alcohol also we got another one. Okay, I wanted to emphasize that you can change those, but let's see which other ones you can change. Uh, inadequate or excessive intake of nutrients. This is an, this is an interesting aspect because, um, uh, you know, it, you can either be too little or too much, and they're both going to have a negative effect on that. Being sedentary with no weight-bearing uh, activity or even excessive exercise, and that is just going to just uh, tear down uh, your bone and your um, rejuvenation processes. So calcium has always been kind of connected to bone and uh, as we, as our team ha has seen, as other teams, as far as it's an, a very important aspect and it's, it's crucial to maintain calcium uh, as far as if you want to maintain bone. So adults over 51 years of, uh, of age or older need at least 1200 milligrams a day as far as that adequate intake. What we found from the women that were part of our project is they were basically getting about 850 milligrams a day. So all of them needed to have some sort of a supplementation. Um, and, you know, I think that our women were fairly average as far as if you look at, uh, you know, women across the scope as far as w within your towns and, and cities. So the, the calcium recommendations, though, as far as you can get too much of a good thing. So the upper level would be 2,500 milligrams. And our, our nutrition team has always encouraged our um, participants 
to meet the requirements through food first. You know, and we do a lot of weight loss uh, management and uh, research in that regard. And, you know, for so many people, it's about, you know, uh, enjoying your food and being able to have a, a great relationship with food and thinking of it as fuel. So we encourage that as well as far as from, from a calcium standpoint. Let's eat it for, through, through food and then let's use supplements when necessary. Um, and so as far as the calcium sources that you uh, could be recommending to your clients, milk and milk products, most people uh, can um, usually understand that. But there's calcium in vegetables and fruits and breads, fish with bones, sardines, you know, mackerel, uh, dried, sea, uh, <laughs> dried beans, uh, fortified foods, and then supplements. Now, for our study, we uh, did give calcium supplements to our, uh, our participants, and we wanted to make sure that calcium was not an issue when we looked at the exercise and how the exercise affected um, um, uh, postmenopausal women and with, uh, with our um, estrogen as well. Those are there are two of our main um, uh, qualifiers. So uh, we chose to use to go with the calcium citrate and calcium citrate is something that you can be able to take without food. It doesn't uh, bother your stomach. So that was, uh, we felt that our women would probably um, have a better chance of maintaining their calcium um, levels and completing their dosage if, if it was something that wasn't going to bother them. So that's why we went with the calcium citrate. So we used the Citracal calcium. We contacted the company and they were able to supply us with free calcium for our, our uh, project. So that was, that was nice. And uh, I also know that uh, I contacted them when I was doing uh, workshops across the country to see if we could be able to have just some sample blister packs. And they were more than happy to offer that and send boxes out um, so people could be able to, the women could be able to try them. So just FYI, sometimes you can get some, some nice product to, um, to help with your program if you're going to do a special uh, weight training session for women or something. But you do want to look at the USP on the label and, and look from a solubility standpoint as well as a dosage standpoint. And we provided 800 milligrams uh, per day of calcium supplements to our women encouraging them to, to uh, take half of that in the morning and half of that in the evening. Basically what we found is that there were anything uh, larger than a 500 milligram dose was not going to be absorbed. So uh, we didn't want them uh, to uh, lose the effect of it, but we also want to make sure that we provided them with as, uh, as much calcium that they could be able to retain in their system. Now sarcopenia, I'm sure, is something that you've been talking about and you've been uh, working with your clients with, and that's the age-related degenerative uh, loss of muscle mass. So it's interesting as far as, you know, here we have women that are losing bone after 30, and we're also losing muscle mass after basically 40. So we have these two issues that are happening, that they're on a trajectory with women that give us more and more evidence that strength training is is imperative for, for women to get involved in and for us as professionals to be able to, to figure out uh, methods to engage them so that they can be able to, to work out on a regular basis and not just for a month or two months but hopefully for the rest of their lives. So uh, one of the aspects that I found helpful when I'm working with clients is, is to show them some of the differences and sometimes I have well, I've got, I've got, well, I don't want to pull my ear. Well, let me see. Uh, you know, I've got like the fat. I'm sure you guys have got this, you know, if you're letting them know this is a pound of fat, you know, if we're talking about weight and weight loss. And then I've got the pound of muscle, which is good too. You know, that looks like a nice big piecey, beefy piece of muscle. But the piece that's interesting with this slide is there's a 21 year old's uh, thigh uh, cross section versus a 63 year old's uh, cross section. And the point that is helpful for, for uh, my clients to understand is that, you know, you can still be the same age or um, the same weight as you were maybe your you know 135 pound client and saying well I've been 135 pounds for, for 15 years I think I'm doing really well well if you haven't had a DEXA or to be able to understand where your percent body fat is and where your lean body tissue is you can have them feeling that they're doing a great job but these kinds of illustrations help them know that oh I need to maintain my exercise I certainly need to incorporate or, or maintain my strength training as I progress so that's a little bit of the backstory about uh, some of the reasons why we were able to develop the, the best exercise program. And now I'm going to give you some of the considerations 
that went into the specific exercises that we uh, that we chose. First and foremost, we wanted to increase the intensity so that we could have a, a, um, a change in BMD at the hip and the lumbar spine. So that means lifting with heavy weights, not light weights, but heavy weights. Uh, the next uh, consideration we had is we wanted to make sure that that the program we designed was was functional and it was mobile and so that the women that were carrying groceries from their car and, and going up the steps to their house could be able to put those groceries away by themselves and have the independence that way. We wanted to make sure that to develop the small muscle groups of the back so that are used for stability and spinal support and posture which was a key aspect of our program. And also to have a stimulus that was a much greater focus than just habitual activity. So walking, as I remember back, the National Osteoporosis Foundation would, con would consider walking as a weight-bearing exercise. And, um, you know, I mean, as far as we need to do more than walking. So, uh, so the, the research that our group and other groups have shared as far as the strength training and the intensity of the groups that we have um, has allowed us to be able to document that strength training is uh, something that can uh, effectively be done by this population. So to counter the curvature of the spine and the posture that occurs with aging, this is another aspect, and not only from a health standpoint, but from a quality of life and from a, an aesthetic standpoint. Our women, you know, just didn't want to become their mothers or their grandmothers. And at this point, as far as when, when I do a program or if we're doing an introduction to women that are interested in bone health, I do a little demonstration and I'm going to try hard. I'm going to try to see if I can be able to, to talk you through this and you can maybe see me in, in, the, in the, the, um, the little video uh, screen. Um, as far as what I'll say is pretend like you're your grandmother and the woman that's over on the left, kind of hunch over, you can hunch over on your chair. And you don't have that, you know, your, your gut's kind of hanging out, but you're hunching over. And then I want you to try to raise your hand over your head, you know, with that, that posture the way it is, okay? And then, you know, kind of take a mental note of where that is, put your hand down, and then we do something we call it, it's a, it's a sternum up posture, which means that we have our women visualize that they have a, a um, string that's attached to their sternum that's pulling them up. It's not from their head but it's from their sternum that's pulling them up into good posture, which means that they're stretching out their shoulders, they're tightening up their, their, their abdominal area, and they're tightening up their tush. And if you're, if you're sitting and you can see people doing this, or even standing, I usually have them stand to do this. And okay, and now I want you to raise your arm. And you can, you have much more range of motion and flexibility. And it gets an aha with them to be able to say, okay, this posture that you have right now, this is what the best program is going to do for you. It's going to allow you to be able to develop these muscles so that you can keep your posture erect, that you can be able to have a good vibrancy when you walk and your, your whole abdominal area is just, you know, nice and, and, and tight and just, you know, feeling vibrant. And you're looking like you're five to seven pounds thinner because of this. So, you know, these little... Um, exercises, and I'm sure that you all have uh, some that you're using as well, but they help them click into, uh, you know, why this, this program is going to be beneficial to them. And we certainly don't want them to do exercises that are counterproductive to maintaining health or that's going to put them at risk for fracture. Now, one of the exercises that, you know, and I've been doing strength training since my college years and been training people in work sites with strength training and writing chapters on body shaping for women, for, for over 30 years. And I always loved uh, the chest press as an exercise. And my clients always liked the chest press. But we opted uh, out of having the chest press be a part of the best exercise program because our physical therapist it said that it's just going to continue to kind of create the forward head. We need to stretch out the back. So, you know, those kinds of indicators uh, we um, uh, um, opted out for as well as doing a, uh, a, an abdominal crunch. We had our women, as far as if they were interested in doing any kind of abdominal exercise, to be able to do pelvic tilts instead of the abdominal crunch. So this study, and I'm going to go through this real quickly, but just to let you know as far as it was a, the, the type of clinical trial it was, is that we had a random assignment of sedentary lifestyle versus this progressive resistance and weight-bearing exercise three times a week at a community fitness facilities for one year. That was our, that was our model. Everyone had calcium supplements 
they were they had the BMD and a DEXA, a wealth of different inventories that we used on them. So 266 uh, postmenopausal women completed the first year of study. And as I said, uh, there are many of them that are still in it in 10 years. So out of this group and this, this clinical trial, we really had four groups. And I'm going to start from the left. We had one group that was no exercise with calcium. So they weren't doing anything. The next group had, uh, uh, had HRT, but uh, no exercise. Then we had exercise, or, 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 or we had exercise, excuse me, uh, but with no HRT. Then we had a group that was HRT with no exercise, and then we had an HRT and exercise group. So four components in there that we could be able to analyze uh, after one year, four years, six years, and 10 years. The workout itself, basically for the first year was about an hour and 15 minutes. We started out with a cardio warm up for three to five minutes. The strength training exercises, which is what I'm gonna emphasize here in uh, shortly for 20 minutes. Then a cardio weight bearing activity. We thought that that could help with bone small muscle group exercises, and then balance and stretching. And I'll, I'm going to give you a brief um, rendition of those as well. But the six ex exercises that we found that built bone were the wall squat and the smith squat, uh, the one on military press, the leg press, the lat pull down, the seated row, and the back extension. Uh, the protocol, and then we'll go through each one of the individual ones, was we, we opted to go with two sets because we wanted to build bone and we wanted to have that strain rate. So it was heavier weight, but less repetitions, six to eight repetitions in good form, except for military press. And because we didn't want to overload them, and from, a, from an injury standpoint, we did a military press for only uh, four to six repetitions. So after the first, when we first introduced the exercises to them, we gave them a, a month to kind of get ready and to understand how to proper ac a, a application and posture and all those things. And then we did what we call the personal best. And that was, you know, do the best, the heaviest amount of weight you can be able to do in good form. And from that, or the one RM, and then from that, we calculated 70 to 80% of that. And that's what their zone was for each, uh, for three times a week. And then we also had moderate to hard days, but I think most of anybody does that. It might be your Wednesdays. Okay, Wednesdays is the day you challenge yourself. And then Mondays and Fridays can be, you know, maintain. Uh, but that was our, our, our protocol. We also worked with, um, they, this, this wasn't one-on-one -on -one trainers. Uh, I had a group of about 15 trainers. We were in five different community fitness facilities across uh, uh, Tucson. And so we had trainings in the morning, at lunchtime, and in the afternoon. And so there was windows of time that, the, uh, that our, our women can come in. And basically, it was about one trainer per six or seven, maybe about six uh, women for the first year. So the wall squat, um, as you see here, this is the way that we uh, uh, asked the women to uh, implement it with a, a, a ball behind their back and a stability ball um, uh, in, in between their, their knees, and they're going down to a 90-degree angle. Once they're able to do that and do that in good form and feel comfortable with it, then we put dumbbells in their hands. Started out with about 5-pound dumbbells, and we worked up to 20. Once they could go to a 20-pound dumbbell in each hand, then they were moved over to the Smith squat. And uh, they did well with a Smith squat. Uh, we used this um, because most of our gyms had the Smith squat. Some of them had some other apparatus that were similar to that. After the first year of exercise, though, what I've seen is a lot of the women have reverted back to the wall squat. And I think that a lot of the reasoning for that is that they didn't have a trainer there to, to work with them and to monitor them. And uh, the Smith squat is, is an, uh, an exercise that you can have some problems with from an injury standpoint. So we were comfortable with them just going back to the, to the wall squat after that first year of, of um, intervention. Uh, the military press, will you do a one-arm military press? I have some colleagues that are, were wondering why we didn't do two arms, double military press, or maybe even do a bar. And we found that uh, this, our intention here was not only to kind of do uh, work with the wrist and work with the low back, but we wanted to work with the spinal uh, vertebrae and we wanted to work with the stability muscles there. And you're going to get much more of that work with one arm pressing up than you would with two. You could also put your clients on a, um, in a, on a physio ball and you could get a lot of that same uh, motion there uh, with the military press. Then the leg press, we were lucky enough to have leg presses in all of our facilities, and this was one exercise that the women just absolutely grew to love. They were scared of it at first, but 
then it came down to really liking it. We got some tremendous strength gains on the leg press, and I'm going to show you that as well. But they once they understood that they didn't have to be scared of it and that they could be able to have a lot of power in it, it was amazing what they were doing. They were lifting more weights than a lot of the regular men that were um, in the facilities were lifting, which was kind of interesting in a, couple, in a variety of different ways. But our women became, you know, the kind of the hulksters that were in there, and they, they looked like your grandmother. And uh, we created a whole new culture in the facilities here at Tucson with this project. The lat pull down. And this has got a, uh, it's more of a close grip than it is a, a wide grip on uh, uh, the bar. And the intention here is that we wanted to see as far as getting a lot of pressure on that wrist as far as if that would, would uh, help that. And also we had a focus on alignment with the study as far as, as far as you wanted to have your, your, your wrist and your elbows and, you know, everything alignment so that it was really working on them being in as good a form as possible. And then seated row was our next exercise, and uh, that's, uh, I think that we did that basically the way that most people would conduct a seated row. The back extension we used, but we only did the back extension for a 45 degree um, uh, angle, and we didn't want to hyperextend the back, uh, but it was just basically to work again with those stability muscles in the back and the spine and to be able to allow them to kind of have a sense of that and and be able to kind of tighten up their core and utilize that uh, piece of machinery uh, for those visualizations. We had small muscle group exercises using TheraBands and physio ball exercises. These were good at the very initial start of our program because it allowed the women to kind of get a sense of their body and space and understanding a lot of the movements if they, since they hadn't been doing them in a while. They also liked these as far as for travel and for at-home exercise. Then we, uh, we did cardio weight bearing activity. Uh, this back, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago was kind of a novel uh, experience. So we wanted to just to see how the weighted vest would work. Uh, we calculated we wanted them to do stepping of 300 steps. So it was about 15 minutes worth of stepping, whether it was going up a, an, um, you know, a um, uh, stairs in uh, the hospital facility or if, if it was outside stairs or using a, uh, a step inside the facilities. The weighted vest, uh, I had mixed uh, emotions about that. Uh, they were big, um, they got sweaty. The women really didn't like putting on a wet, sweaty uh, vest from someone else. We had about six vests in each facility. We got them, we started them out with uh, about 12 pounds of weight and we, worked, we wanted them to work up to 30 pounds. I think they got up to about 25, but it just was not something that uh, they wanted to maintain after the first year of exercise. So now, I would say maybe uh, one or two women still do the weights, uh, the weighted vest. So what I'd encourage you to do as far as I think it's a fun novel thing to do and you might want to work it into your schedule, but um, for, for our mechanisms and for the women, uh, it just it wasn't the best thing uh, for them to, to put into their workout. They were much more interested in going hiking and putting a backpack on than the, using the weighted vest. And then we had balance and stretching exercises, the wall press that you see in the center side, toe ups that lead it, lead it into a swan dive for, for balance, and the pec sweat uh, uh, stretch on the physio ball. So they enjoyed these. These were a nice cool down for them, uh, and it was a way for them just to kind of do some, some stress relaxation if they were at work. They were able to take these away and, and utilize them on their daily basis. So uh, the thing that was exciting about what, what we were able to provide with this program and the intensity of, of putting our staff into it was that we were able to get a, a, an average of 77% uh, adherence to three times a week at community fitness facilities. And this is a time when people really struggle to, you know, to get to 40 or 50%. And, and as you've seen, this was an intensive strength training program. And so we're real proud about that, and I'm going to speak at that at the very end as far as how we, we engaged our women so that they felt that it wasn't just an exercise program, but it was a part of their daily lifestyle. So let me show you, though, as far as before we, I have got some, some, um, some data slides here for you. This one, I, I want to uh, take some time just to show you what happened from a uh, strength increase in our women. So the way to read this as far as I've got the six exercises that they did on the left and then we've got the baseline of uh, the exercise and the hormone replacement, the ones that did take estrogen 
on uh, next to that. And then, then we had exercise and no hormone replacement therapy. So our group was divided into two and, and they, self, they were self-selected. We didn't give estrogen to our, to our population. So luckily we got 71 in each group. So we have a baseline, but, but the interesting fact is as far as the increase in, in strength was pretty much compatible with the exercise with, with the hormone replacement therapy as well as the exercise with, without it. The leg press baseline, we had women that were pressing 260 pounds plus or minus 70 pounds. So, um, and at the end of 12 months, they were pressing 420 pounds plus or minus 103 pounds. So this was a 67% increase in strength in that. If you look over to the exercise, the other uh, group, they had a 75% increase in strength. This, this we were just really um, kind of shocked that this was happening, but what we found out is postmenopausal women have got a lot of strength in their legs. The lat pull down, you see that the baseline is about 95, 98 pounds with plus or minus 18, 15 pounds. So the, the post uh, 12 months, 121 pounds plus or minus 18, 30% increase in strength or 26 with the group with no HRT. Seated row, 28% increase in strength, 25 for the ones with no HRT. One arm military press, 39% increase in strength, 34% in the one. So back extension, uh, 47 and 36. This is, I don't know, but this gives me goosebumps. I mean, it's almost better than ice cream when I see women that are in this age range that can be able to do this. And it's not like they're training for anything big. These are you know, women that are just interested in their health. So uh, we're, we're just, <laughs> do you think I'm excited about that? I am. Okay, now here are some of the other effects that we got as far as bone sites. And uh, for this one, it's all four, uh, four bone sites that we total body and the three other bone sites. The exercise is in the red, the no exercise is in the blue. Uh, so as you see that there is more of an increase uh, one year effects uh, in bone. Uh, bone specific uh, responses as far as we have the control group that's over on the right. So the control group is losing bone that first year. The exercise group only is gaining bone, not quite as much as the HRT group, but this was back when the Women's Health Initiative was talking about hormone replacement therapy and whether or not that we, that it needed to be, um, uh, you know, a, a very much a conscious individual choice with it. But here we were uh, allowing people or women the opportunity to be able to say, well, I think I'm just going to do exercise or I'm going to make a conscious decision to do them both. But as you see, the HRT and exercise, we did have much more increase in, uh, in bone at all sites. Now, here's a four-year change in uh, the femur trochanter. And uh, you can see here that the controls are continuing to lose bone and the exercises are continuing to, um, they're not maintaining, they're even building a little bone there. Here for your changes, and this is a different kind of a slide because what we wanted to look at is we want to look at the, look at the, uh, the women in the exercise program. But when you do a, a project like that, this, you have to, what's called an intent to treat. So you have to uh, include everybody in even if they are only coming like once a month. But we had women that were maintaining like 95%, 93% ad adherence that are still doing it 10 years later. So it was almost like you have your really good exercisers and your ones that you, you would probably write off if you, if you had them as a client, but you had to keep them there. So we've divided this up to tertiles of exercise, which means that the first tertile that's over on your right-hand side, those are, uh, after four years, those are women that have maintained attendance of 50% up to 93%. Uh, attendance uh, on the average uh, over the, the four years. Then the middle tertile is 15% uh, to 49% attendance. And the, la the lowest one is 0 to 15% attendance. So the interesting piece about this, uh, this slide is that not only did the women who came all the time that are coming twice and three times a week, did they were able to maintain bone, but interestingly this middle tertile that had 15 to 49% attendance they were still maintaining bone too. So that allows us to see as far as if someone gets a little disillusioned with exercise, if we can just keep them coming back a bit, that they're gonna be able to have some long-term effects. But if they're just showing up, you know, once or twice, you know, um, a month or if, you know, lower than 15%, that they, they will have some negative effects. 
Now this is body image and, and, and self-concept has been something I've been looking at for a, a long time. So I, I wanted to, to investigate that with our women. And so you'll see this is again through turtiles of exercise. The women that were heavy, um, not heavy, but uh, active exercisers and attenders, they had increases in their body cathexis and self cathexis, which basically means their satisfaction with their body and their satisfaction with their life. So we had great, uh, big increases in, or, or larger increases in uh, body cathexis in both the first tertile and the mid-tertile. But the ones that were just coming intermittently, they decreased their feelings of satisfaction about their body, and they didn't feel as good about them, themselves. So again, it kind of, it, it weaves into this factor as far as how do we keep our people involved with programs, engage with programs, and keep them coming on a realistic basis? And then how do we kind of encourage them to come back if they're, they've fallen off the wagon a bit, but they're still, you know, have a receptivity to open up. So six year results. Uh, we, had, we found significant factors related to calcium intake, exercise attendance, the hormone re the therapy was an indicator, as well as interestingly, the lean and fat changes. And I think I've got some, okay, so we'll go through this. Now, this slide represents that we found that uh, the no HRT is uh, in the more clear, and then uh, the some or more uh, years of HRT is in the more um, uh, shaded area here. But the difference here that is so uh, start startling is that the ones that were maintaining their 800 milligrams of calcium supplement for those four years had significant bone increases versus the ones that didn't. So uh, I know when I first saw this, I thought, okay, so that, that means that, that calcium has its own effect, uh, you know, beyond exercise. And it, it does have an, uh, you know, it does have an effect. So note to self on that. Okay, so the annual measure of body composition. Again, we're in the tertiles here. So we have the highest group that our regular exercises are in the bottom of this graph. And what this is, is body weight. So we didn't encourage any kind of a diet on this program. Uh, we, because that when you, when you go on a diet uh, in postmenopausal years, usually you will lose some bone. We didn't want our women to lose bone as they were they were working out, so they just maintained their regular eating habits. But you can see that the exercise allowed them to have a lower body composition than the middle tertile or the uh, the lowest tertile. So and there's a, uh, I've got all these papers uh, that are uh, on your references on your handouts. Uh, but that's Gen B's paper on body composition. That's one of the last ones. It's a six-year paper if you want to look at that a little bit more. So how do we get all this in? Uh, how do we keep the attitude and the excitement and enthusiasm going for, for 10 years or even five years of programming? And um, you know, I come from a, from a worksite wellness background uh, in a social context, psychosocial perspective. So I integrated a lot of programming here that you, that you would see uh, in a worksite and you, you see in, in some fitness facilities, but I just want to reinforce um, that it's so valuable to kind of create more of a wellness kind of an approach to your exercise programming. So we had education and skill development. And for, for these women, they were very interested in their bone health. They got involved with the program when we recruited them because they wanted to make a difference and, and complete a research project that was going to help their daughters and their granddaughters and be a significant contribution to the community. So, you know, one of the, the, the big ahas here is as far as, you know, recruit people, do some sort of a project with them, put together a pilot project and have them commit to that. They love to feel like they're being utilized in an effective way. We had research updates every year for our women. We had social um, integration every month, every other month. But they loved the aspect of learning more about what was happening. Uh, also, we created uh, what, what I call an I can do that environment. As far as once the first cohort came in, we allowed them to see and, and went through, which was about 25 women. Then every six months, we brought a new cohort in. So this, 
this initial first year took like three years to actually do. But the first cohort became the mentors for the next cohort. And I would bring them in when we did the recruiting so the women could be able to say, I know you feel scared. I know you feel like you might be, not be able to do this three times a week, but guess what? We did it and we're going to help you through it too. And you think that doing this leg press with just, you know, a couple 45 pound weights are, is enormous. Just wait, we're going to get you up to eight 45 pound weights, but you got to follow us and, and you have, we have to do it together. So that was very inspirational and it allowed us to not just be the professional people that were around, but to, to, to build the social context with it. We had engagement exercises that uh, each year, and it was two major uh, promotions uh, that were lasted four to six weeks. Uh, we used typically a New Year's resolution and then a summer fun month. Here in Tucson, it gets hotter than heck in the summer, and a lot of times people just don't want to do anything, so we needed to kind of kick, kick up their uh, involvement there. And then we had monthly promos. So the thing that, that when I do workshops with uh, fitness facilities um, across the country, you know, I think this is your, your bulletin boards are the cheapest way that you can be able to really make a difference. And yeah, the, 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 the challenges is being able to utilize them and work them on a regular basis. So here you see one of our summer promotions. It was an uh, Olympic event, and that was a team uh, challenge. And then the other one is this Passport to Health, which was a, um, our, a lot of our ladies were, were traveling to Europe on the summer. So we said, okay, we'll go with you. Or you can send us back postcards, but we'll have a food and fitness challenge. When you go to Austria, we'll have an Arnold personal best day. When you're in France, you can be able to climb the steps of the Eiffel Tower. But it's just some way of integrating it into their lifestyle and their day style. We also did a lot of family oriented focuses as far as having some um, park events. We usually had at least one in the summer. We would have something at Christmas time and we'd invite all the family and friends to come. And as you can see, it was fun games, not competitive games, but they loved this and their families loved it. And it was just a nice way to get our, our team as well as their team involved. For Thanksgiving, we created a food drive uh, for our local food um, co-op. And we also had a Thanksgiving Day uh, thankfulness project where you wrote something that you, you, know, you thought was positive about um, one of your colleagues or, or the people that you're working with. And it was a lovely way to kind of get that sense of gratitude and have a positive psychology uh, integration into that promotion. We did some intensive uh, promotions as well, the Valentine's Day murder mystery. I could do a workshop just in and of itself on this one. But, uh, but the point I like to make with this slide is that there are a lot of um, programs and excellent programs that you can get out there that can help you uh, kind of infuse some incentive pro programs into your program. But it's also kind of fun to create them yourself. And this was basically kind of a, a, a how do I want to say it, as far as the you know, the television soap opera, we just started talking about what could we be able to do. So, so the owner of the fitness facility is found dead and the, um, the suspects are all the fitness trainers. And so everyone had a certain reason for what they did and how they did it. The women were, Charlotta Holmes was the major investigator, but all the women were detectives. And each day we had a different clue. And then we had a, 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 um, a, a, um, motivational meal where they figured out, you know, what the precise uh, um, situation happened. But the women contributed their own ideas, and they liked it so much. We did this four years in a row. So it's just, you know, putting effort into a program. So many people say, I don't have the time, I don't have the energy, but this helped bond our trainers. This helped bond our women. And you know, if I was a staff of one or two, I would still create ways to be able to make. Make your day and make the effort that you're doing in, in the facility more fun. So the social support aspect, we did uh, at the initial, we had no money to do any kind of uh, uh, extra social support programs. So this was all very creative. As I said, the bulletin board is thus this, your single you know, secret weapon. I, we changed this monthly at each one of the facilities. And if you see over here, we, I find ways and I encourage our, the trainers to find ways to, to acknowledge as many people as possible. So it just wasn't about your athlete of the month. But you had your best attitude. So that was just about one of the ladies that was there. So they had 12 best attitudes a month there. Sometimes we'd have two a month. Then you had your, your, your perfect attendees. Then we had our personal best over here for the women that were in the 500 club 
or the drill sergeant material, or you know did great on their personal best. So you, if, if you look, you can count out, out of this gym, there are probably 35 women that are working there. You'll see 32, 34, 35 names on the board. And then in the middle, it's whatever the program is that we did, the incentive program, and some pictures for that. So that created the buzz at the facilities. We had potlucks. We had cooking contests. We went out to uh, restaurants and everyone divided up the bill. We were able to build a camaraderie through that. And I, that's, it, it just, uh, I can't reiterate how important it is to be able to have those kinds of social functions. So all in all, to kind of create the kind of um, culture that we did, we had the skill development on you know, what it takes for postmenopausal women, the, the value of the strength for building bone, for building muscle for maintaining posture, for maintaining a healthy weight. We had mentors available both uh, in our team as well as the women who've been, who went before this, teaching, coaching, peer support, the opportunity to have this in the community, the convenience factor of having it in several different areas within the community, resource, the practice, the encouragement, repetition. All these things are social, psychosocial and developmental skill task to repeat a habit. And, you know, I've, I've gone on interviews and television interviews and people will ask, well, you know, that just sounds like too much stuff. And, you know, I think, okay, well, just pick one. Just pick one. Most people and most comp uh, clients and most trainers and professionals are doing a lot of this. What I'm encouraging you to do is to keep focusing and picking more of these so that you can be able to integrate it in. So it's a constant win-win uh, for you and your clients. So summary for this is that between 30 and 50, we encourage you to do a, your first bone scan just so you have a baseline and then start lifting weights. So that's going to hopefully that can, you know, open up to all your clientele that, that you work with. From 50 to 70, we want to have yearly bone scans and weight lift at least two to three times a week. And then 70 to 90 bone scans as needed. You modify the weight lifting. If they're in osteoporosis, you need to modify this and do a, a focus that is more of a Miriam Nelson's focus as far as the strong bones and um, strong women, and then focus in on uh, balance and fall prevention. So basically, uh, the exercise plan that, that our team would recommend for you is weight bearing, having your clients do stair climbing and steps, hiking with backpacks a plus, dancing, at home, weightlifting, you can use the Strong Women, Strong Bones program or others that are out there that can use um, dumbbell weights at home. And in the gym, you know, to get the results that we did, we needed to do the heavy strength training or, or using the equipment. And it's, it's tough to do this without that, those pieces of equipment that are there. So we encourage you and we, sh we, we want to share with you this best uh, exercise program. And then do the balance and fall prevention. And um, the other thing that we have is as far as we did do the, a book on this. And um, I don't get anything out of this book. <laughs> Not that I'm irritated about that at all. No, I'm not. But we put together the book, and the book has, uh, you can get this as a credit, too, with Desert Southwest Fitness. I think it's basically the only way that it's, it's offered right now, or you can just you know, buy it through them. But uh, each chapter, we had our medical doctor do the medical chapter. It goes through a lot of the things that I talked about as far as osteoporosis, osteoporosis screening that you saw there. Uh, I've, I, I wrote the chapter on exercise and the different ways that we did the training. Uh, but it also has handouts at the end that can be really good as far as am I at risk. So you can use that for your clients. Your bone building activities. Uh, how much calcium do I need? So this book would be a, a really nice uh, ancillary to the program that I've just presented. And um, uh, if you have any other questions that we don't get to during the, uh, the webinar, please feel free to email me. I'd be more than happy to share that with you. Or if I don't know the answer, uh, refer you to someone that does. So guess what? I think we have five minutes for, for questions. So I hope, hope I wasn't too fast. Some people, I talk fast normally. So uh, hopefully it was, it was in a cadence that you appreciated. But that's our, our, our best uh, exercise program. And I hope that you can utilize it for your clients. Thank you, Love. That was an outstanding presentation. The information was very solid, and what I want to just tell the attendees is that we have recorded this presentation, and if you are in attendance today, then you will receive a link so that you can review uh, the entire presentation. So that hopefully will address some of the questions that are coming in now. So let's take some questions, and 
they are really coming in fast so let me see if I can um, uh, get some good ones up here um, you know, I see one as far as the 10-year uh, phone results. We are yes. just writing that paper right now, and um, I'm not sure as far as when that's even going to be submitted. Um, but uh, I think that as far as using the the last um, um, paper that I wrote was for clinical, it's, it's in your handout, it's for the uh, clinical news for uh, ACSM's uh, journal. That one has some good information and some of the... Um, uh, the tables that I used. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen with the 10-year because while we do have about 40 women that are still exercising, uh, we didn't, our funding stopped after the first year. We were just lucky to kind of get some other grants to kind of keep these women going for a while. So so, so the point is, as far as that um, uh, that 10-year paper will be out, I'm not sure if it's going to tell you too much more than our six-year results uh, and the, the last paper that I wrote. Okay, um, Susan Hathaway uh, asks, did any of the women in the BEST study have osteoporosis? They were, uh, at the beginning, they did not, and they had to be uh, in a healthy range, uh, but some of the women that, as they went through, and some of the women that I showed you on the slide, the, the pictures of the groups of women, they are now in an osteopenia range, and uh, so I would recommend, if you have clients that have osteoporosis, um, uh, this is an osteoporosis prevention program, uh, and I think that it can be used for, for osteopenia. But once you get into osteoporosis, I'd go more with Miriam Nelson's a lighter uh, um, rendition. Now, Miriam and um, myself and Tim Lohman, who was our principal investigator, we've done a lot of, of uh, work together nationally. And Miriam would say, as far as when she's asked this question, she goes, well, is the best program good for osteoporosis? Because any program is good, strength training program is good. The intention of our best program is to be able to focus on that posture, on that sternum up, and to lift as heavy a weight as possible in good, in, in good form. So, but if you have a low bone in your, uh, in your spine, you, know, you just need to be cautious of those and you need to uh, modify it down. So I wouldn't have the heaviest weight, but you know, still doing that exercise, but doing maybe 50 or 60% of it should still um, you know, be worthwhile for your, for your client. Uh, but that, that question comes up a lot, and, and that's, uh, again, a reason that I don't encourage the, um, the Smith squat unless you do have a trainer with you that understands how to do that properly. But that wall squat, you know, I have women that do have osteoporosis that start with the wall squat and keep with it. So some of those, as you know, the, the, the other six exercises, they're fairly, you can use those fairly well, uh, even with low bone. Becky asks, uh, should women do plyometric exercises? You know, I don't, uh, I had a colleague, Don Chu, that was, is like very well known for plyometrics, and I'd have to refer to him and some other ones on that. Um, from, from what I've seen, I think that it could be useful. My concern with, uh, with the women that I work with is that they had, we did some skipping within our, our program. Uh, and there are some incontinence issues, and there was just some discomfort with, you know, the jarring of doing a plyometric exercise. So I, I would need for you to kind of refer that over to someone who understands the plyometrics and maybe a plyometric uh, usage for, for seniors or for, for those that might have a low bone. Uh, but uh, go for I mean, investigate it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Carlisle asks, if I have a client who is over the age of 40 and has not had a bone scan, how do I know the strength of the bones to avoid any injury? You know, I, and I'm not an MD. I'm, a, I'm an exercise physiologist. But uh, so uh, the, the thing that, that I would say is you don't. You don't know that. So that's why having that risk factor analysis, figuring out, you know, are they, are they short of stature? Are they thin? Are they uh, Caucasian or Asian? You know, all those, if they have, have they had a fracture in their life, have their fa has their family, their mothers had a fracture, or their grandmothers or aunts, all those things are important to know, and then even their lifestyle. So you can, you can assess a lot from that, and then, you know, we had this one woman that was a part of the BEST program, and she, I thought she, her bones were going to snap the first day she came in there, and she is still working out in the program, and she's, 
she's remarkable. So she came in with low bone and she was able to build some of it. And now in her seventies, she's back in, down into low bone again, but she's certainly, you know, much less than what she would have been if, if she didn't lift the weights. So, uh, so you just have, you have to get that bone scan. Now you can do some of the other things like the heel scan. And there are a lot of other, um, ways to kind of get an indication that's out there, which are better than, than none. But, um, you know, it'd be helpful for her to be able to say to her doctor, you know, if she has had some sort of family history, usually they'll okay it, um, even if it's not typical for insurance to be able to get reimbursed. If you say that there's a family history, they should okay something in their 40s. But we certainly feel that, that women in their 40s need to get it. And I've just seen too many girls at the college that have had some sort of a dieting issues or, or, uh, and, and are not drinking milk anymore like my generation did. And they're coming in with low bone or osteopenia, you know, in 21, 22. So it's going to be, it's going to be a big issue for our society. Um, Joanne asks, uh, she says, as a trainer, I understand not wanting to create any further tightness in the chest muscle due to posture issues. However, what about muscle imbalance by not working all major muscle groups? Well, that's a good point there. And I think that, um, I had probably a similar question to our physical therapist who was uh, a former uh, bodybuilder. So she did understand her muscles and the whole aspect of training. Uh, and she just felt that, uh, that, that our women were going to um, uh, get enough of a workout and enough of a balance uh, with the other parts of the exercise that we do it. I've been doing the strength, the, the best program for, uh, about well 15 years now and um i don't do my chest exercise but i do it as a you know as an ancillary to all my other physical activity um but you know you might if you feel strongly about it i think you need to go with what you feel strongly strongly about for your for your clients but you also as far as i wouldn't do the i wouldn't do the chest press last because that's going to be able to that's going to tighten it up do that first and have them you know do their um uh, do their physio body stretch after that so that you can be able to stretch out those muscles. Uh, but maybe not put as much emphasis on, on it as I used to do chest press challenges with my clients. And, and uh, I think I'd second guess that now for, for women over 50. Okay, thank you. Amy asks, how could you do this program with someone with hand grip challenges like thumb, hand, forearm, arthritis, tendonitis? Okay, so, well, the, the military uh, press is certainly a challenge. We had a couple women that had some problems with that and carpal tunnel and different things, and they used a glove for that. Um, it is going to be more of a challenge to do that. And um, let's see, the leg exercises you can be able to do okay. Um, our women with carpal tunnel, they were able still to do the, uh, the row fairly well. They had some trouble on the overhead um, military press, um, and the lat pull down. Um, I don't know, you might need to get creative with how, how that happens. And, uh, cause you don't then want to do one side of the body and not the other. So I'd work with maybe a fit, if you have physical therapists that are in your community, uh, someone that, that might have some way of rigging up something for that grip that could be helpful. Uh, or you, you might just have to um, go with some other alternatives. You, know, you could go with the physio ball and the, um, the TheraBand exercises. That could help some, but you might just need to use an alternative uh, measurement for or exercise program for, for that person. Wonderful. We have one more question. This is from Sherry Ann. She asks, if a woman continues to work out through menopause, will she, will she still get the sandbag abs? The sandbag abs. That's like, um, you know, I have, I have this little thing. I, I If I was going to give you a word to the wise, I'd probably tell you to exercise. Because one of the, what, what most people don't really realize is you can suck in your gut, but you cannot suck in your thighs. I think that sandbag, you know, wherever it is, if it's in your thighs or your abs, I think that there's a certain amount of that. And it's just, it's, it's the redistribution of your body fat. And, um, I think that as far as if we keep a a active and we keep exercising, there's a big difference. So, so when women used to tell me, oh, I'm in menopause now and I'm, I'm gaining weight, so I've got this gut. And I say, well, I'm 56 now and I work at it, but you know, I don't have that gut yet. 
And so, and I, I know a lot of my colleagues and a lot of the women in the best, best program, they have been able to circumvent those challenges because they're regular exercisers. So I think it's one of the benefits that we, we, we show them that you need to do the cardio, you need to do the strength training, and you need to do your flexibility, but you also have to watch what you're putting into your body so that you have enough fuel, but that you don't have excess. And with all that together, we can create a really vibrant, wonderful postmenopausal woman that likes her body. Body, that loves her body and that has us to thank for the support that we give them and the direction that we give them. How's that? Beautiful. Thank you so much, love. Well, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions about the exam process, just give us a call at 1-800-873-6759 or email exams at dswfitness.com. Thank you again, Love. That was a wonderful presentation. It's great to have you back. We hope you will all join us again. Thank you for attending, and adios from Tucson, Arizona. Thanks, Tish. Thank you.